Knowing who you are brings you confidence. And that comes a little bit with age and experience. And right now I feel really content with who I am, which makes me a happier person. From CMC Markets, this is The Artful Trader. And there are lots of opportunities. 100 point swing on the Dow. In order to be confident in the long run, it does take patience and discipline. In a battle between emotion and logic, emotion will always win, hands down, every time. Hello and welcome to The Artful Trader. I'm Michael McCarthy, Chief Market Strategist at CMC Markets Asia Pacific. In our third season, we talk to the experts in their own fields to uncover what gives them the confidence to succeed. We uncover confidence, unlocking the secrets behind resilience, preparation and growth and how it can make you a better trader. Today, we're speaking to tennis legend Pat Rafter, the serve and volley champion. Rafter wrapped up a career in professional tennis as the only Australian male with back-to-back US Open titles. Since his retirement, Pat has swapped volleys for property and built an impressive portfolio around Australia. First of all, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us for the Artful Trader podcast series. Thank you. If it's all right with you, I'd like to start at the beginning. You were born in Mount Isa? Born in Mount Isa in 1972. I was the seventh uh, baby born to my mum and dad at that particular time, and then she finished off with three more. Does coming from a big family make you more competitive, do you think? Well, now I've got kids of my own. I try to work out what makes a, a kid or a child his own personality or her personality. And, and the one thing that I found is that I just can't, I can't see anything. Sometimes you, you wonder if environment or parent pressure or whatever it might be could create that type of uh, competitiveness. I certainly was competitive with my older brothers, not so much with my sisters, but um, I, I sometimes look at my uh, son and who played a little bit of tennis and I stopped him playing it because I just felt that he he was not playing it for the right reasons. And if I was one of those really, really pushy parents, it would have been interesting to see what would have happened to him. I know he would have hated me. Um, not to say that he loves me anyway. He's 17 years old. <laughs> I, I, sometimes, I sometimes wonder about that dynamic. So, Pat, it's a long way from the bitumen courts of Mount Isa to Flushing Meadows. When did you know? Was there a time when you thought, I'm going to aim as high as I can. Yeah, I mean, there was no defining moment when I when I said to myself or anyone around me that I, I'm I'm going to be a really successful tennis player. I was always going to be a tennis player. I just didn't know how successful I was going to be. And my friends laugh a lot because I grew up with a lot of you know Australian players, tennis players. Um, some carried on with tennis and a lot didn't. And we sit down and have a beer now, and I'll just laugh. This guy, I can't believe you're as good as you were because you're so crap as a junior. <laughs> <laughs> That's what friends are for, eh? <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> so uh, there are a number of phrases that, that, that are associated with you and your achievement. Uh, you've just mentioned one of them um, you, about being the best version of yourself. Mm-hmm. A couple of others I've heard attributed to you, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, work harder than anyone else. Yeah, that was something that I came up with. Um, I used to look across at other players and train and I would see what they're doing and go, no, I'm going to train harder than them and I'm going to do an extra five minutes and then I'd get on the court and I'd do that. Or if I was in a gym, I would stop at, you know, maybe 40 minutes on the bike going hard and go, no, no, do five more minutes because that other person's not doing that. And that was something I did for a long time, uh, I'd say for 10 years. And it really held me in good stead because mentally it also helped, not just with my game, but um, when you get in those tough situations, you know you've done that extra little bit than the next person. And I needed that for me. Right, so the hard work gave you the confidence when you needed it. Yeah, exactly, mate. Um, and I drew on it, and some people don't need to draw on that, but for me, I needed something extra. What were the mental obstacles that you had to overcome to reach the success that you did? Probably belief would be the first thing that comes to mind. I never sat down and thought that I was going to, I was the best or I was going to be the best or I was going to be even a tennis player. So to actually think that I could be one was very difficult and that came through results. So I needed to have success for me to start believing and that comes through hard work. Um, I wasn't afraid to take uh, chances uh, when I was coming through. I, I... I guess my game by nature was pretty chancy in the way that 
uh, it was a serve volley game. It was a high risk game coming in, putting pressure. But as I got better at it, I realized it wasn't actually a high risk game because the numbers were on my side. The more I came in, the more points I was winning than losing. So it actually started becoming statistically good for me to come to the net. Did you suffer from nerves before big matches? Yeah, but as I got into the match, I was okay. And right. towards the end of my career, I suffered with nerves and making big decisions and actually backing myself. And I was oh. still only 28 years old, but I knew mentally that I was finished because I had some bad injuries. But I, I got everything out of the game that I could, that I believed in, that that I believed I could achieve. Yeah, could I have got more? Maybe, I don't know. I realised at, at a stage that uh, tennis wasn't what life was about and I made a mental note to myself that it's time to move on. And so oh. when I was 27, 28, I wanted to live life, live, have a family, just be a normal sort of Aussie, I guess, just get back to what is life all about. And tennis wasn't it. I was chasing a ball, getting upset, getting uptight. So I'd already sort of tapped out mentally. And I'm glad I got out when I did. I mean, tennis is a game where there's a clear winner and a clear loser. Um, and you had some astounding victories, but you also had some what to an outsider appeared to be demoralising losses. How mm. did you bounce back from those? Well, that's the game with tennis is win and loss. And those demoralising losses weren't demoralising when I was 15 and 16. They were demoralising when I was maybe at the top of my game. But I could always put that back into the sex, into that, that that compartment that I was just happy to be there, I guess, and I never thought I'd be here anyway. So let's put things in perspective all the time and go back to when I was that journeyman trying to learn the, the craft of the game. So what was a big setback for me was when I lost consistently for a month or two um, and couldn't get through and lost all my confidence, you know, getting through first, second rounds, that was really tricky. But I always knew that if I worked hard and trained really hard, that those losses would eventually turn around. And they always did. So when I did have those losses, it was uh, not working hard enough. Pat, um, as a professional trainer, I've been lucky enough to also manage trading teams. And there's many different paths to success in trading, as I imagine there is in tennis. But the one factor we'd look for when we're hiring traders was determination because we could teach people almost anything else. What does determination mean to you? Probably the epitomizes someone like Leighton Hewitt, you know, in terms of determination, he he just never ever gave up. I mean, that to me is determination, is is never giving in. Uh, when things are going tough, you, you're gonna dig in a little bit harder. Everyone has a cracking point. I never saw that in Leighton. It was so hard to get out. For someone like myself, it cracked a little bit earlier. But determination um, and wanting that will and that drive to be the best you can be, uh, yeah, there's no substitute for it. However, in the game of tennis, there's also a certain amount of talent, and I'm sure it, it goes through to trading as well, just seeing or doing those little things that maybe someone else doesn't do. Pat, I want to drill into some key moments in your career. Um can you tell me about your most memorable clutch moment? Did it teach you something about yourself? Uh, it was in 1992. I was traveling through Asia. I was six weeks on the road with my mum to travel with me. So I'm 300 in the world. I'm not very good. And I broke down one time. We were in Tokyo. I think I lost first round of qualifying. And we went down to McDonald's to have dinner. And she said to me, then, you know, I asked you obviously how I was feeling. I just broke down and cried and just said, I don't think I'm good enough. I think I'm done. I was 19 years of age and just saying, I, I feel like I've let you down. I've let the family down. And um, I feel like I'm at a crossroads in my career right now. And mum said to me, you don't owe us anything. You know, you've, you've tried hard. If whatever you want to do with your life, go ahead and do it. So don't ever feel like... Um, we have any extra pressure on you. And I felt that pressure, I guess, but that was never put on by them. It was put on by me uh, living up to the expectations of my family or making good 
of the sacrifices all that family made for me. So that was a defining moment and I decided just to give it one more go. I hesitate to ask you this, fellow, but... Don't. Can you tell me about your most memorable choke? Oh, yeah, Wimbledon, 90, uh, 2000 against Sampras. That was a beauty. Right. right. So that was a, a moment when I didn't deal with the pressure very well. I'd come back from shoulder surgery I had at the end of 1999, not knowing how I was ever going to get back into the game because at the time we were a bit unsure if I was going to come back and how I was going to deal with the workload of serving and playing tennis on my shoulder. It just wasn't just wasn't holding up very well the way I played and the way I served so I had in the back of my mind I didn't know how many more chances I was going to have in tennis so all of a sudden I'm in the semi-finals of Wimbledon and I beat Andre Agassi in a big five-set match I then go into against Sampras not expecting anything getting myself in a situation where I'm up a set and I'm up 4-1 in the tiebreaker, serving in the second set, knowing that Pete was emotionally a little bit tapped out as well. Uh, he was dealing with some type of niggly injury, and I thought if I got this set, he's going to go away. And knowing that and feeling that, I felt my heart rate go through the roof. I couldn't control it. I subsequently went on to play a eh, okay point, but weak, and then double fault to the next point to go back to 4-3 up um, and then feeling really, really deflated. Somehow I got a return back on Sampras to serve at 4-3 at his toes and uh, he proceeded to pop a ball up in the middle of the court and again, I've got another great opportunity and I've hit the forehand in the bottom of the net and knowing then I would um, couldn't control my nerves. So, <laughs> yeah, I have no problems talking about it but just recounting it now it um it certainly brings back one of the one of those really devastating moments in my in my career um but at the same time being really uh, fortunate uh, that i was in the final of a wimbledon as well um i was really appreciative of that so although there's a big negative i also felt like i was probably back in, into the game of tennis as well it sounds like the people around you, your coaches, your support team, are a very important part of the confidence and the achievements that you made. Yeah, they've got to put up with a lot of crap because you are a solo athlete. You are doing it all yourself. You do let things affect you. You do get uptight. You do get tense. And if you have a really good support group around you that can understand that and then try and pull you back when it's needed to. Um, and I had my family around uh, Tony Roach, who was working for the Davis Cup at that time, was also around at times to help pull me back into line. They were really important people to help shape my career. So, But at the same time, they also weren't people that allowed me to behave and misbehave or do anything like that. However, I'm 25 years old, 26, whatever, by that stage. I'd sort of grown out of that sort of behaviour anyway. Right. It was down to you by that, that time. Yeah, it is. And, and when you're on the court as well, I like to work things out myself. Um, and a lot happens now in the game of tennis. The coaching setup is that the coach does a lot for the player. We were brought up where you have one coach amongst eight kids. So within that, you're not being told what to do. You actually have to go out and work things. There's a lot of trial and error. And you have to have a lot of downs. And that's a great thing about tennis is that you get – you, when you make a mistake, you get hit pretty hard with it and you have to learn very, very quickly. And I'm sure that would would apply to trading as well. You, you make calls and you've got to pull back really quickly. Obviously, the consequences in trading are a bit different because you can lose a lot of money for you and someone else. But in tennis, you just, you know, you, you've lost the match. Um, and so in terms of financially, it's no big deal. Oh, well, actually it can be. <laughs> you know, I think As a man who made more than $11 million in prize money. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Okay, yeah, actually, no. Maybe, yeah, if I thought about the money a bit more, but money was never a driving force, I guess, when I played right. tennis. It was about being the best I could be. And I mean, I walked right. away from the game 
um, giving up a lot of money. And also throughout my career, I gave up a lot of money not chasing certain tournaments. So, yeah, money was never... You also gave away. I, I believe you gave half of uh, one of your US titles, the prize money, you gave half of it to the Starlight Foundation. Yeah, I was always brought up, I you know, watching my father give money to the uh, communion box at the church all the time. And I saw that, you know, it's just little things you see as a kid. And it sort of helped shape me for who I, for who I became. So it was never about having millions and millions and having a boat, a plane and all that sort of stuff. Well, that'd be nice. But it was about uh, also giving back. So, oh. you know, the, the great thing about tennis, and I compare it to a lot of other sports, is, you know, like golf's similar, boxing's similar, but when you get into a team environment, um, it's tricky because you can actually be dictated by what happens around you by other people's mistakes. But in tennis you're making those calls and you're living through those calls and you make your own luck and you also make your own bad calls. So for that particular thing, I actually quite like tennis because you don't, you're not governed by anyone else's mistakes that can out, that can drag you down or your performance down. I know as a trader myself and as a manager of traders, there's two times when traders are in real danger. The first one's obvious, it's after big losses. That knocks confidence down and traders have to work hard to recover from that. But the other time they're in real danger is when they've had a run of successes. And overconfidence mm. can be financially fatal to traders. <laughs> it sounds like you're, you, you've, you've told us already your family did a good job in helping you stay grounded. But were, were there times in your playing career where overconfidence affected you? Yeah, I, I think so. It generally came up when those little sneaky players who you knew weren't bad, who were pretty good, who competed really well, who could just sneak underneath you and grab you when you weren't, when you were at least expecting it. Obviously, the big players, you know what you're going to get. You know, it's going to be tough. You, make, you better make sure you're ready for it. Sometimes complacency, yeah, can, uh, well, most times sort of, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll Bring you unstuck. Your tennis career was brought to a sudden end at 29 um, because of the shoulder problems we've discussed. Was that a massive blow? No. I already knew I was going to stop anyway. Um, right. I was actually, could, I couldn't wait to finish. I, right. I wanted to move on. I didn't have anything else to prove to myself. Um, there were other people around me that wanted me to keep going because they never wanted me to have unfinished business and they never wanted me to look back at when I'm 30 years old and go, oh, maybe I should have or I could have. Not once in my life did I ever look back and say, I wish I kept playing tennis. And that does happen with a lot of athletes. You do see it. They they look back and they go, oh, or they come back. Comebacks don't normally work out too well when you get a bit older. Um, you can have, do it when you're younger. We saw it with Andre Agassi. You even see it with Ash Barty. But they were young, um, but very difficult to happen when you're older. But for me, emotionally, I had moved on. I had a, a child straight away when I finished. My new life had just begun, and I didn't really reflect back on my career, and that was a life ago. It felt like I'd had two lives, you know, my business life. And now it's time for family. Did you know you were going to go to real estate when you left tennis? Or was it something that no. you... No, 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 no. These are just in, in investments and deals. My brother does all my investment. He um, also managed me. His background was accountancy. And Steve and I think the same way. You know, we're, he, He's very conservative. And I'm conservative. I only put in what I can afford to lose into a lot of deals. I've worked too hard. I can never make that money again. I've been very fortunate right. to have a little bit of money put aside that I can live you know, a really nice life. Um, it, it won't be overindulgent, but it um, it's great. I think we have a, an amazing life. So property is, is just another part of my portfolio, I guess, that I put money into. That's uh, quite a contrast to your tennis playing style. You're, you're a high-risk you, player. Yeah, and that's what we talked about a bit before. There's high risk in it, but it's also, it was also turned out to be more points won, you know, by coming to the net, if you look at statistics. 
So is that about knowing yourself and trusting your strengths? Exactly. Ex- exactly right. And and I take that through to now um, in, in terms of investment. My brother, who thinks along the same lines as me, we, uh, we, we definitely go into um, projects that offer, you know, sort of conservative yields, I guess. Um, I mentioned a couple of the sayings associated with you, Pat. Um, another one is don't let setbacks discourage you. Yeah, it's just about getting back up again. And tennis has a lot of setbacks. Um, life has a lot of setbacks. Oh. Um, but everything will be okay if if you're willing to go deep um, and, and not be afraid of getting your hands dirty. Never been afraid of it. And looking within myself and knowing that I've just got to work hard and things will turn around. You, you learn from the pain. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're, they're things you hear all the time. You, you learn from your losses. And yeah, you do. You don't learn a hell of a lot from your wins. But that confidence that you brought into play on the court, is it different to the confidence you have now in life and in business? Knowing who you are brings you confidence. I And that comes a little bit with age and experience. And right now I feel really comfortable with who I am. I was just talking to someone about it the other day. Uh, I started feeling really comfortable in my own skin around about mid-30s. Um, I remember at the end of my tennis career, I felt really happy with who I was. And then when I started finishing my career, had a couple of kids, I just started feeling where my place was in the world and who I was. Um, and who I stood for, I guess. You don't ever know that when you're when you're coming up and you're learning, you know, who actually am I deep down? And within that, you get a lot of confidence. Well, I do anyway. I feel really content with who I am. Um, not much really shakes me anymore. Um, yeah, I mean, I get, I get pissed off if someone cuts me off at a set of lights driving or something like that. I, I do get up, upset at times, but just reshape me of, I guess, of who I am. And probably podcasts, and this is the reason why I'm doing this podcast as well. It's the first podcast I've done. I, I'm, I love them. I, I mean, I, I listen to hours and hours of podcasts, and I'm learning so much all the time, and it's helping shape me again of who I'm going to be and and who I'm becoming. And it sounds like, although you know, you've always apparently aimed high, you expect that there will be problems along the way. Oh, gee, if you don't expect there's going to be problems, then you're in trouble. I mean, right now I'm not aiming very high, but there are going to be issues. Things are going to come up all the time with life, with family, with health. It's a funny thing. I have been diagnosed, not diagnosed, but when you do those Maya Briggs charts and things, I have this thing that shows up, which I'm not overly happy with, but it shows up a, a lack of empathy. And it's an interesting one because I don't show it in many ways. But in other, in other, in other things, I show a lot of empathy. It's, it's an interesting thing. Um, but when it comes to taking ownership, hard work, I have very little empathy for people that aren't willing to do it. Um, if you got a cold, I don't show a lot of empathy. <laughs> you know, if you're a little bit sick, you harden up a little bit. <laughs> but when, um, when things get deep and heavy, I think I start showing a bit more empathy. Um, uh, but I, I guess what I'm trying to say there is just helps shape who I am. Um, and again, it's, I sometimes wish I could show a softer side, and but I don't know. I, I death death is going to come to us, so I try to live life pretty simply and um, and try to keep things on a pretty even keel. Gee, I got a little deep there. I'm sorry. Don't know how that sort of <laughs> came into no, that's things. podcast gold, <laughs> Pat. <laughs> <laughs> Pat, you've been very generous with your time. Thank you very much. Is there any final words you'd like to like to give us? No, I just hope I haven't confused anyone um, with how I finished the podcast. I, I I'm, I'm experimenting on, in terms of the way I'm trying to reshape my life and listening to and being more open to to new and wonderful experiences that life is out there. Um, I 
I can't be happier with uh, how I live my life. I, I love it. I think we live in the most amazing place. Um, and I just try to stay grounded as much as I can. I'm Michael McCarthy, and you've been listening to The Artful Trader, Confidence Uncovered. Listen to The Artful Trader on your favourite podcast app or at theartfultraderpodcast.com. Join us next time.